everything we have to fear is in war. Fear there is no substitute for victory. Let us never negotiate out of fear. We stand undivided, forever united, fighting hand in hand for the liberty we burn, for glory and honor for our sons and daughters, ever mindful of the lessons we've learned. Let the torch of freedom burn. Welcome to the intersection of faith and politics. This is Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green. You can find out more about us at our websites, wallbuilders.com and also wallbuilderslive.com. A lot of great information at both of those websites. We encourage you to check them out and also share them with your friends and family. Put a tweet out there or make a post on Facebook and, and let them know about these great, great resources that will educate them about who we are as Americans and also give them action steps on how to save this very unique system of freedom for future generations. In fact, the program we're in the middle of today is called Exceptional. It's about what makes us different as a nation. What are those principles, those timeless principles that made us so special and the principles that we must preserve and protect and pass to the next generation? That's what we're all about here at Wall Builders, looking at things from a biblical and a historical point of view. Uh, every program, we look at something that's happening in the culture today and say, what did the Bible say about it? What does history teach us about it? What did our founding fathers know about that? What safeguards did they put in the Constitution and the Declaration? All of those questions, that's the way we approach things here at Wall Builders Live and also at Wall Builders. So check out the websites, wallbuilders.com and wallbuilderslive.com. Let me also encourage you on our radio website there to check out the listing of our stations. If you go to the homepage for wallbuilderslive.com, up there in, uh, on the side there in the banner, just click on Stations. It'll list uh, have a map there. You can click on your state, find all the stations we're on in your state. And if we're not on a station in your area that you would like to hear Wall Builders on, then please take those links, send them to that local station, and encourage them to check out Wall Builders Live. We find so many stations that want to carry Wall Builders Live because of you, our listeners. You're the ones that let them know about it. They pick up the station. And uh, we have a new member of the family here at Wall Builders Live, and we're able to reach so many more people right there in your community and your state. But you're a big part of that, so check that out there on our website and share it with your friends and family as well, not only those local stations. Uh, you can get people that you know to listen to Wall Builders Live just by downloading it right there on our website or getting the podcast. There's so many different ways to get this information. And when people find it, they do something with it. One of the things we're so proud of, you guys as our listeners, is that we have one of the most active radio audiences in the country. So often we have guests on the program that talk about, after being on Wall Builders Live, I got more of a reaction from your listeners than I do from some of these other programs that are on thousands of stations. So you guys are so great that listen to Wall Builders Live. Thank you for being willing to take action and participate and what's happening out there and, and doing your part. I mean, that's what this is really all about. I mean, sometimes our part is to is to just give you the information, the education, the inspiration, whatever it might be. But then you take those actions in your local community or in your state, and it makes such a big difference. We want to hear those stories when you do that as well. So be sure and email in your comments or your questions to radio at wallbuilders.com. That's radio at wallbuilders.com. Dot com. All right, enough of that information. Let's jump back in where we left off yesterday. We were listening to a program by David Barton that he recently did a new DVD called Exceptional. And this is all about what makes us so different as a nation. Absolutely love finding out what those principles are that make us unique. Because if we know those principles, then we know what to do to preserve those principles and make sure that our kids and grandkids get to enjoy the same thing. Yesterday we started with Exceptional. Today will be the middle part of the program. And tomorrow we'll get the conclusion. So let's pick up right where we left off yesterday with David Barton and exceptional. We said, now government, these are things that come from God, therefore you can't mess with them. There's a certain set of rights that come to every individual and you're not allowed to touch them. That's on the other side of the fence for you. You can do these things. And so that declaration, that's a second principle of American exceptionalism, the second key to limited government. There are certain things the government's not allowed to mess with. Now, just as we have a difficulty defining American exceptionalism, Many people have a difficulty defining an inalienable right. So what is an inalienable right? Well, fortunately, those who wrote that word in the Declaration told us exactly what that word is. For example, one of the folks that you'll see that had an influence on the Declaration that went on to sign the Constitution is John Dickinson. John Dickinson said, An inalienable right is a right which God gave to you and which no inferior power has a right to take away. 
So an inalienable right is a right that comes to us from God, not from government, and so nobody can take it away from us. Alexander Hamilton, who signed the Constitution, one of the three authors of the Federalist Papers, this is what he said. He said, inalienable rights are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. He said, they're written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the hand of the divinity itself and can never be erased or obscured by moral power. So Alexander Hamilton, these are rights that come to us from God. Don't, don't look for these in government documents because that's not where they originated. These originated from God. They didn't come from government. They came from God and they're not to be touched by any moral power. John Adams said, inalienable rights are antecedent to all earthly governments. They're rights that cannot be repealed or restrained by human laws. They're rights derived from the great legislator of the universe. John Adams says the same thing. Inalienable rights are rights that come to us from God. They're not to be restricted, not to be touched, not to be restrained by government. And notice he uses a key word here. He said they're antecedent to all earthly governments. In other words, Inalienable rights are rights that came before there were any governments. Antecedent, coming before. What's the first government in the history of the world? The first human government in the history of the world is recorded in Genesis 9. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Today, we heard that our founding fathers were largely atheists, agnostics, or deists. The writings of founding father Richard Henry Lee strongly refute that assertion. Richard Henry Lee was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and he is specifically the man who made the motion in Congress that America separate from Great Britain. Following his death, his papers and correspondence, including numerous original handwritten letters from other prominent founding fathers, were passed on to his grandson. After having studied those letters, this was how the grandson described our founding fathers. He declared, The wise and great men of those days were not ashamed publicly to confess the name of our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In behalf of the people, as their representatives and rulers, they acknowledged the sublime doctrine of His mediation. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. When Noah got off the ark, Noah and his three sons and their wives, they got off, and God delivered to Noah what are called the Noahide laws, seven categories of civil laws. That's the first time you have civil government in the Bible. It's the first time you have civil government in the world. So John Adams says inalienable rights are antecedent, or they came before the first civil government. In other words, inalienable rights are rights that came in Genesis 1 through Genesis 8. The Founding Fathers were able to identify roughly two dozen inalienable rights that came before government ever appeared in the history of the world. Now, what would some of those two dozen rights be? Well, if you go to Samuel Adams, the father of the American Revolution, he pointed out, he said, well, in the Declaration, we told you that among others, there was first the right to life, second to liberty, thirdly to property. So those are three in the Declaration, but they weren't all of them. The Declaration said, among others, there were these three. And so 11 years later, when the revolution is over and when we have the first Congress and when George Washington is president and we get that Bill of Rights done, the Bill of Rights said, hey, you remember we told you that among others there were those three? Let us give you some of the others. You have the First Amendment right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. That's a God-given right. didn't come from government. Government can't restrict that. Second Amendment, you have a right to defend yourself. You have a right to keep and bear arms, what the Founding Fathers called the biblical right of self-defense. That's a right that comes from God. Government can't restrict that. Third Amendment, you have a right to the sanctity of the home. The Fourth Amendment, you have a right to justice. The Fifth Amendment, you have a right to the protection of private property, and on through it goes. But that's not all of them. So when it gets to the Ninth Amendment, it says, and by the way, there are others, and the ones we didn't mention, they're still retained by the people. And in the Tenth Amendment, the ones we didn't mention, they're still retained by the states. So they said there are numerous inalienable rights. And here's some in the Declaration. Here's some more in the Bill of Rights, but this is not all of those inalienable rights. So that is the second principle of American exceptional. The first is there's a divine creator. The second is there's a set of rights the divine creator gives to every individual. They don't come from government, and government is not allowed to touch them, not allowed to restrict them or regulate them or restrain them. So what's the third principle of American exceptionalism? We find it in these words. The Declaration says, 
that to secure these rights, what rights? Inalienable rights. The Declaration says that to secure these rights, these two dozen inalienable rights, governments are instituted among men. Now we find the purpose of human government. The purpose of human government, according to the Declaration, is to first and foremost protect our inalienable rights, make sure that we have a right to exercise those rights that God gave us. The purpose of government is not first and foremost to make sure everyone has a job or make sure the economy is sound. It is, according to the Declaration, it exists first and foremost to protect our inalienable rights. James Wilson is one of those who signed the Declaration of Independence. As a matter of fact, James Wilson is one of only six founding fathers who signed the Declaration and the Constitution. James Wilson was the second most active member at the Constitutional Convention, and George Washington took James Wilson and put him on the U.S. Supreme Court as an original justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. James Wilson started the first law school in America, and these are the textbooks he used in that first law school. This is what he used to teach students about American law and American government. And in these law books, this is what he tells students. The principal object of government was to acquire a new security for the possession of those rights which we were previously entitled by the immediate gift of our all-wise and all-beneficent Creator. What James Wilson says is the principal object of government that we have in America is to create a new security for all these rights that God gave us. And the reason they said that is we had those God-given rights, but the British crown was suppressing those rights. It started interfering with those rights. The Declaration of Independence lists 27 grievances while we separated from Great Britain. Founding fathers said, hey, these are God-given rights, but the British government did not protect them. They started regulating them. We've created a new government, and the principal object is to acquire a new security for the protection of those rights which we were previously entitled by the immediate gift of our all-wise and all-beneficent Creator. So that's why American government exists. And you have Sam Adams who agrees. Sam Adams said this. He says, government was originally designed for the preservation of the inalienable rights. And remember, he said that the inalienable rights were first, a right to life, secondly, to liberty, and thirdly, to property. Isn't it interesting that they said right to life? It would have been really helpful if they had been talking about abortion, but obviously if they weren't, that's a Roe v. Wade issue of recent decades, and abortion was an issue back then. And, you know, people say that. I'm not sure why they say that. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. As long as there have been people who were pregnant, there are people who didn't want to be pregnant. Abortion's not a new issue. As a matter of fact, this little book right here, open it up, and on the inside, it's uh, 1808. It's the first American edition. It's Observations on Abortion. It was an issue back then. So when they talk about the right to life, it does include unborn life. As a matter of fact, if you go back to James Wilson's textbooks where he was teaching law students, he taught them about this. He said, very simply, with consistency, beautiful and undeviating, human life from its commencement to its close is protected by the common law. He said, in the contemplations of law, life begins when the infant is first able to stir in the womb and by the law that life is protected. Wow. Wow. He's saying as soon as you know there's life in the womb, at that point, life is protected. And by the way, notice he said that it was the common law that protected unborn life. The common law was recognized in the Constitution through the Seventh Amendment. When they argued Roe v. Wade, they used the Ninth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment. He said, no, 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 it's the common law that does not permit abortions. He said from the time that you know there's life on the inside, at that point, that life is protected. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. How should we respond if confronted with frustration and conflict? The proper response was given over 200 years ago in a lengthy speech when Benjamin Franklin told the delegates at the Constitutional Convention, in this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth, how has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding? Have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? God governs in the affairs of men. I therefore move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. Benjamin Franklin knew that prayer was the proper response. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. Let the 
here's where the technology changes. Back then, how long did it take you to know there was life on the inside? Two, three months. How about today? Within six days of fertilization, you know there's life on the inside. The point is, as soon as you know there's life on the inside, whether it's months or whether it's six days, at that point, the life is protected. That's an inalienable right to life. Government exists to protect inalienable rights, including the right of the unborn. Now, John Witherspoon, signer of the Declaration, said, you know, that's really what makes us different from other nations. In other nations, in Europe and elsewhere, they think that parents give life to the children. In America, we understand that parents don't give life to children. God gives life to children. So in other nations, they do abortions, but, but not here. And so he said very simply, he said, a perfect right in a state of natural liberty is the right to life. He points out that here in America, we have denied the power of life and death to parents. It's not parents who give life. It's God who gives life. That's an inalienable right that comes from God. It doesn't come from parents. So that's the position that we held. But notice that Sam Adams says, first is the right to life. First, that's an important term. Now, I've been involved in politics for a long time. I went through five elections here in Texas for partisan political office. Uh, I've been involved in a number of campaigns. I've recruited dozens of people for office. I've trained hundreds of people to run for office. I do campaign schools. Uh, there's a number of members of Congress, dozens that I consider to be very good friends. We have a network of several hundred legislators on the state level we deal with. And what I have learned over time is that any candidate, any elected official, if I can find out where they are first on the life issue with a 90% degree of certainty, I can tell you how they'll vote on other issues. If I know where they are on life, I'll tell you how they're going to vote on economic issues. I'll tell you how they vote on regulatory issues. I'll tell you how they vote on UN treaties. You tell me the issue, and if I know where they are on life, I can, within 90% degree of accuracy, predict the others. Because, you see, the inalienable right to life is the first of the rights. If you don't get the first one right, you rarely get the second, third, fourth, or any others right. And you'll find that those who are wrong on the life issue are also wrong on the First Amendment right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. Hey, kid, you can't say God at graduation. What were you thinking about? Oh, no, businesses don't have a conscience. No, if you're wrong on the life issue, you'll be wrong on the right to worship God publicly. You'll be wrong on the right of conscience. You'll also be wrong on the Second Amendment right to defend yourself, to keep and bear arms. If you're wrong on the life issue... You'll also be wrong on the Third Amendment right on the sanctity of the home. And it is amazing how that those who are wrong on the life issue are also wrong on the definition of marriage issue. And if you're wrong on the life issue, you'll also be wrong on the Fifth Amendment right on the protection of private property. Just like the Supreme Court, they gave us abortion. The Supreme Court also gave us the Kelo decision and said, no, 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 folks, your private property doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the government. And if you're not using your private property right, if you're not generating sufficient income, the government has the right to take it away from you and give it to someone else who will generate sufficient income. See, if you get the life issue wrong, you get all the other inalienable rights wrong as well. Now, all of these are considered social issues. And political pundits say, oh, the voters don't care about social issues. All they care about are economic issues. Well, if that's true, there's certainly a lot of low-hanging fruit for people to care about. You've got debt, and you've got deficit, and you've got taxes. You've got lots of economic issues to care about. But let's just say for a minute we're going to play the game of we don't care about social issues. Now, when you look at social issues or economic issues, one of the things you find is that any given session of Congress, between 10 and 13,000 bills are introduced every session. That means there are dozens and dozens of votes on nearly every issue that comes along. So that's why in Washington, D.C., you have groups that monitor different categories of votes, like National Right to Life. They will look at all the votes of how the congressmen vote on the life issue, and they will rank all those congressmen from the 100 percenters all the way down to the zero percenters, 435 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate, and they'll tell you those that are the best all the way down to those that are worst. Now, the life people do that. And over on the economic side, you've got all sorts of groups that just monitor economic positions. They don't care about the life issue or, or guns or anything else. And so whether it be National Taxpayer Union or Americans for Tax Reform or Americans for Prosperity or Freedom Works, they look at economic issues. But it's a really interesting thing. If you will take the economic voting record and compare it to the life voting record, you'll find that if someone is 100% pro-life, they nearly always turn out to be 100% on economics as well. If they're 0% on pro-life, there turn out to be 0% on good economics. It's a one-to-one -one correlation. Same thing when you look at the worst folks in the, in the House and Senate on life. They're also the worst folks in the House and Senate on ec economic issues. But that makes a lot of sense. 
I mean, if they won't protect your life, why would they protect your money? Your life's worth a whole lot more than your money. And if they won't get the most important thing, they don't get the least important things. So that's why when Sam Adams says first is a right to life, that holds true on social and economic issues. And by the way, because of what I do with political officials and others, people ask me for an endorsement. And, and you know, here comes a dog catcher. He says, hey, I'm running for office. Will you endorse me for office? And I'll look at that dog catcher and say, what's your position on abortion? He goes, whoa, did you not hear me? I said, dog catcher. We don't do abortions as dog catcher. I know. But if I can find out your position on abortion, that'll tell me your whole political philosophy. I'll know what your position is on so many other things. And you see, the problem is you may not stay dog catcher. You might actually decide you want to run for school board. You might end up running for city council or for mayor or for state representative or state senate. You might run for governor. And it's a whole lot easier to knock you off as a dog catcher than it is to knock you off as a governor. Hey friends, Rick Green, you're about to hear from some students at Patriot Academy this last summer from all over the country. I encourage you to visit PatriotAcademy.com. Right on the homepage there, a video is going to start playing. It's just 60 seconds. You're about to hear the audio from that video, but you're really going to want to watch the video and share it with your friends and family. We are so excited about what God's doing with the next generation. I have a destiny. Freedom isn't just for politicians. It's meant for each of us. To play a role. To be significant. To be significant. To live with purpose. My life has meaning. I have a destiny. Who am I? Does it matter? I was given one life. If not us, then who? If not now, when? Let's change the world. People say you can't change the world because you're young or inexperienced. Because you aren't ready. But I'm training every single day, and I have a voice. I will give this life everything I've got. Because I, I am a champion. We all have one life to give. I am a patriot, and I have a destiny. We're training up a generation of champions to change the world. Hope that you will help us and that you'll spread the word and let others know about it. Visit today, patriotacademy.com. Let the torch of freedom burn. If you use the life issue, you'll find that you can screen those out of the process that will end up not being good on economic issues or any other of the social issues as well. So that's the third point of American exceptionalism. Now, notice the three points. In the first, government acknowledges that there's a divine creator. Second, Government acknowledges that there are certain rights that came from the creator, not from government, and therefore government can't touch those rights. And third, government acknowledges that its primary purpose, the number one reason it exists, is to make sure that every individual can practice openly their inalienable rights. So what's the fourth principle of American exceptionism? The fourth principle is articulated in these words in the Declaration. And to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitles them. That has just told us that there is a fixed moral law. Really? How would you get a fixed moral law out of that? Well, that statement contains eight words that everyone back then recognized. Those eight words are the laws of nature and of nature's God. Now, that doesn't say a whole lot to us today, but it said everything to them. Those words, those two forward phrases came out of this set of legal writings right here. This is from William Blackstone. These are the most famous law books of that day. Thomas Jefferson said that American attorneys read Blackstone's commentaries in the same way that Muslims read the Koran. They spent time in it. They were dedicated to it. They knew exactly what that eight-word phrase was. Now, that eight-word phrase is comprised of two Four word phrases, the laws of nature and of nature's God. And according to Blackstone, right here in volume one, chapter two, he talks about those eight words. And those words, he explains, that's the dual revelation of God. 
Now, a lot of folks say, wait a minute, what dual revelation? I thought there was just one revelation. Got No, there's a dual revelation. We're out of time for today, folks. That was David Barton you were listening to. His new DVD called Exceptional. For more information on that topic and that DVD, visit wallbuilders.com. We'll have an easy link today at wallbuilderslive.com if you're downloading the program there. Or if you're listening on one of our stations around the country, just go check it out at wallbuilderslive.com. Click on that link and you can find out more. And you can share it with your friends and family. You like what you're hearing today. If it's encouraging you, if you're saying, hey, that's something I can do to help preserve freedom, then make sure you share it with your friends and family and the folks in your church. Be a Paul Revere of today. Be willing to share that information. Be willing to warn, hey, we can lose these things if we're not careful. We're we're losing them, actually. It's not we can lose them. We are losing them because we haven't been paying attention. We haven't been involved. And maybe you have, but you need to help get more people involved by just spreading the word. Be one of those folks that's willing to send that tweet, send that email, make that post on Facebook. Don't be one of those that says, oh, don't talk about God and politics. No, that's exactly what we need to be talking about. We need to be talking about what's happening in our culture and how to preserve this freedom for future generations. So check all all those things out at our websites at wallbuilders.com and wallbuilderslive.com. We're going to pick up tomorrow right where we left off today with David Barton in his presentation on Exceptional. Thank you so much for listening today to Wall Builders Live. Stand undivided.